Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I'm going to give you a quick take on, based on actually very limited hands-on experience with it, Canon's EOS R. Yeah, actually it won't be that quick. But before I do, I first want to thank Adorama Camera for making it possible for us not only to spend a little hands-on time with the R and a pile of glass on the streets of New York City, uh, but to provide very tangible support. So, shouts out, and again, big thanks to Danielle, Fernando, and Maria. Oh, yeah, okay. Second, uh, some quick housekeeping as we prepare to head out to Europe next week for our Photokina adventure. Uh, I want to remind you that right after we return, we'll be doing our first ever photo walk. That's going to be on October 6th, up on the High Line in Manhattan. It's free. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, there are already a bunch of people signed up who we're looking forward to meeting, and we encourage you to join us. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, share, and support us by using our affiliate links down below. We thank you for that. And if you've been visiting with us, if you've been watching us for a while now, and actually love, I think that's the criterion, what we do, I invite you to join us as a patron of our work over at patreon.com slash Hugh Brownstone. Okay. I've spent days struggling with the title for this video. At first, it was going to be Canon EOS R, Stream of Consciousness on the Streets of New York. But as I looked at the footage and my notes, it became Canon EOS R, Bold, Brave, Compromised. At one point, thinking about my own long history with Canon and the easy vitriol of the web these days, it was going to be Canon EOS R. There's no point in being upset. But in the end, the fact that first, our B-cam happened to be Fujifilm's APS-C based X-H1. Second, that we just shot with its new brother, the Fuji X-T3 at a launch event the night before. And third, that we're actually taking a pair of Micro Four Thirds cameras with us to Photokina, the Panasonic GH5 and G9 led me back to the overarching issue of price and timing, which was essentially what I covered just a week ago, days before the official Canon announcement, in another video titled Canon EOS R, the one big question ahead of the official announcement. I'll put a link to that video down below in the show notes, and I encourage you to view that first if you haven't already seen it, because Mulling over it again and again, I think I was right. In the end, it's all about price, beginning with the R's body only price of 2300 bucks. But of course, price needs to be placed in context. So let's get into the details. At the end of which I think the central role of timing will be crystal clear. As will paradoxes. So one, dual pixel AF is all that in a bag of potato chips, especially with the new R lenses. Super smooth, seamless, actually. Coming from even the Sony a6300 uh, and the Panasonic GH5, I actually, literally, laughed out loud when I saw how good the dual pixel AF was. Tracking works great. Okay, it works great. Except when it wasn't, because dual pixel AF is not infallible, no system is, and though it is arguably the best system out there, the gap is closing. Sony's IAF in continuous focus mode is unmatched by Canon. Uh, for the moment, anyway, I hear that an update will come soon via firmware. I was surprised by how well the Fuji X-H1 did. The new X-T3 promises even better AF performance and was excellent up to the 12,800 ISO limit at which I chose to shoot the previous evening, though continuous AF in movie mode is still on my list of to-dos to evaluate. Uh, I haven't had a chance to go hands-on with a Nikon Z, so unfortunately there's nothing I can say about its AF performance at this point. I hope we can make that change soon. Two, the R lenses look and feel superb in a 21st century way. They are lighter, faster, smoother, and quieter than virtually all of Canon's full-frame EF lenses. They are sharp. They are crispy. 
But while the 35 1.8 and 2470 f4 are image stabilized, relatively small and moderately priced at 500 and 1100 respectively, the 51.2 and 28 to 72 are not. They are big, heavy, and expensive. Uh, 2300 at just over two pounds for the 50, and even three grand at just over three pounds for the 28 to 70. Unless you intend to shoot both on a tripod, you are giving up a lot by not having IBIS. And it has to be asked, why on earth would you want to shoot with these kinds of lenses on a tripod? But if you don't use a tripod, how long will you actually be able to use them? How long will you be able to hold them? Call this paradox number one. The new R line has very fast glass for low light performance, which cannot find its fullest expression in the IBIS less R for which it is designed. Hold that thought. While we're at it, let's place mark the prices and weights of the full frame equivalents from Fuji. The XF16 to 55 2.8 we used on the XH1 sells for a thousand bucks and weighs in at two and a half pounds. While the XF35 1.4 is 550 at less than seven ounces, and the XF56 1.2 is 900 at just under a pound. These are excellent lenses, although it should be pointed out that these are the full frame equivalents when shooting stills on the R. When shooting in 4K video, yeah, hold that thought too. Uh, let's remember that while none of these particular Fuji lenses is image stabilized either, the $1,650 X-H1, actually $1,950 with the optional battery grip, which if you shoot video, you'll definitely want, does have excellent 5-axis sensor-based, not digital, sensor-based IBIS. Now, pop quiz. Which camera captured which screen grab with which lens and why do you think so? Please post your comments down below. Three, autofocus with the new EF7200 F4 with the basic adapter was excellent. It did not feel like it was adapted at all. And that is both a big deal and a relief if that kind of performance across the entire line holds because while you can adapt your Canon EF glass to Sony, Fuji, Panasonic, and others, I've never found an adapter or focal reducer on any camera body, other people's comments notwithstanding, that worked nearly as well as native mount glass. But not all lenses are created equal when it comes to autofocus and adapters, which has led Sony, Fuji, and Panasonic to build out their own lens lines. Call this paradox number two. While Canon and Nikon have just introduced their new short flange distance mounts, these guys have been taking advantage of short flange distances to design newer, smaller photo and video optimized lenses for much of the last decade. While not as complete as Canon's or Nikon's legacy glass lines, especially at the super telephoto end, they all have reasonably robust lens collections with excellent optical performance along with some real dogs, too, at the consumer end, just like Canon and Nikon. Four, Canon's neutral density adapter is brilliant, simple, and works really well. It's a real boon for videographers. This is another big deal. Except, of course, that native R lenses don't have this option. So, uh, call this paradox number three. The most convenient lenses to use for video on the R are Canon's legacy EF glass. Five, the colors from the sensor and the image quality from the lenses are what you'd expect from Canon and what you can now expect from the R line. Just beautiful. Crop or not, 4K video footage still looked lovely. Stills were classic Canon 5D Mark IV. Really lovely. But the color science gap is rapidly closing too, with Fuji especially, and more recently Sony and Panasonic, putting out really nice imagery. The hard reality we experienced on the street is that differences between the Canon R and the Fuji X-H1 came down not to the cameras themselves, but my haste in trying to get the R back within the time limit we were given, being more concerned with overarching observations than detailed testing that other folks like DP Review are far better sorted to do, and not taking the time to dial in the settings, not even taking the time to mount external NDs because I felt like we didn't have the time. 
which at least in part tells you why I am so ready for manufacturers to build NDs into hybrids. Guys, make the cameras as big as you need to, but please just do it. And while this doesn't rise to the level of a numbered paradox, we ought to pause here for a moment to reflect on what a year or three makes to improving color science and then how much more can it actually be improved once we reach some kind of critical threshold without going to higher bit depth. Six, the camera feels great in hand. Best grip in the hybrid world for me. And Canon is the only company other than Panasonic among the ones I've been talking about that has a flippy screen, which we've learned to love, not because we vlog, my eyesight is not good enough to see a three inch diagonal from a couple of feet away, but because it allows us to do low shots looking off axis which is great for documentary and street photography, as I mentioned in my take on the Fuji X-T3. On the other hand, the menu system was non-obvious to me. Where the heck is... I just want to find... You know what, let me try the quick menu. Uh, how the heck do I get to... I'm looking in the usual suspects kind of places. Nothing. I don't even see it. Though to be fair, I stopped shooting Canon three or four years ago, and with no dedicated dials for the basics like switching between movie and stills mode, it drove me nuts. By comparison, the Nikon Z has a simple dedicated video switch near the uh, viewfinder. The Panasonic has a permanently labeled movie option on their classic mode dial, and the Fuji has an engraved movie mode on their shooting mode collar. I guess this is what happens when camera manufacturers place unprioritized customization above the basics. Much as I was intrigued by it, the multifunction bar also drove me nuts. No haptic feedback, often non-responsive or too responsive because my press to activate it was too short or too long, or the lag between it turning on or off was just short enough or long enough to motivate me to press it again, starting the cycle all over again, all of which was exacerbated by the fact that someone had changed the settings for it in the first place to ISO, and I had to go back in and change it to AF mode. I ended up simply giving up, given our time pressures, but I would not give up on the multifunction bar quite yet. Hold this thought as well. The thing of it is, with the multifunction bar, the new mode button dial, which is pretty much straight from the Leica CL, the novel, curiously underutilized on-off dial, and new customizable lens ring, ergonomics are sufficiently different from that of traditional Canon DSLRs that they will require significant remapping of current Canon shooters' deeply ingrained muscle memory. Call this paradox number four. Another huge value proposition of the R is that Canon shooters won't have to learn a whole new system Yet the relative pain of going to another camera system is lessened because you have to do a lot of that anyway, at least at a physical level, with the R. In fact, I'd say, and I well recognize that this is a personal preference and reasonable people may disagree, both Panasonic and Fuji offer superior ergonomics. Still, kudos to Canon designers, really, guys, for trying to do something modern especially with the multifunction bar, more specifically to my way of thinking, trying to solve a modern problem that no one else has. As in, there's autofocus, there's ergonomics, but now I think we have to recognize that we've got a very particular instance of both to be addressed, intersecting at what I'll call AF ergonomics. That is, the attempt to use physical means to reduce autofocus complexity, or at least speed up the rate at which we switch among all of those freaking settings and use cases, which actually slow us down. I think this is an important step, at least while we live in an era where algorithms and processing power are not sufficient to do that for us. But it is coming. What are we up to? Seven? The all-intra footage played well with my 2017 5K 27-inch iMac, though my machine is highly spec'd, 4.2 gigahertz quad core, Radeon 580 GPU with dedicated 8 gig of memory, another 32 gig of DDR2400 RAM, one terabyte SSD, eight. 
about that 1.7 or 0.8 crop factor. If you've already got a pile invested in cannon glass down to 10 or 12 millimeters for an effective wide end of 16 or 17 millimeters, the wide end of the holy trinity of zooms, you're not the kind of shooter who moves instantly between video and stills. If you are okay with depth of field becoming less shallow during video in exact proportion to the crop, that is, for example, the 51.2 then has the depth of field wide open of an F2, and the 24 to 70 F4 then has the depth of field wide open of a 6.8, and you recognize the Canon's non-STM EF lenses were designed for a different photography-only era when noise from the AF motors themselves were less of an issue, when point-to-point -point speed was more important than focusing smoothness, and that you may eventually want to move over to the R's if you want the best image quality and the best autofocus performance. And even then, you can live without 10 tenths image quality because of the crop and the less than stellar IQ of most of Canon's EFS STM lenses if you go that way first. Well, okay, the crop doesn't really matter. Because in our limited shooting, 4K in the real world looked pretty darn good when used with Canon's best lenses. But if this isn't you, the crop matters. Bigly. Call this paradox number five. Another core value proposition of the R, image quality and bokeh, are turned on their heads when you switch to video because of that crop and the potential use of consumer grade slower EFS lenses. Nine, if you don't intend to use the R for run and gun one man operation, don't mind using a gimbal when you want dynamic motion. Don't intend shooting handheld stills at shutter speeds more than one or two stops under the reciprocal rule, or are simply a tripod shooter. The fact that it doesn't have IBIS will not be much of an issue for you. As long as, and I mentioned this earlier, at least your lenses are stabilized, though when you're shooting on a tripod, you typically don't want lens IS turned on anyway. For everyone else, though, this is a huge issue as 2018 comes to a close. IBIS is a brilliant technology, actually more important than lens quality and sensor quality when you're shooting handheld at low shutter speeds, even high shutter speeds when working with long glass. I'm going to repeat and refine that, and feel free to disagree respectfully in the comments below. IBIS is more important than a good sensor, the size of the sensor, or good lens under many, if not all, circumstances. As for those folks who assert optimal lens IQ is best without IBIS, I understand that may well be true in the lab or according to the software tools used to help design lenses, but out in the real world, I think this is, for 99.9% .9 of us, 99% of the time, simply irrelevant. IBIS makes more of a difference. You can check the stats yourself. Yeah, no, you can't. That's called creative license. You get the point. I'm not saying every photographer needs IBIS. IBIS is less important for still shooters than it is for video shooters, for example. If you're a pro sports or wildlife photographer using a monopod with a high-end gimbal, I get it. You don't need it. And I didn't need IBIS on the X-T3 to shoot at 1 500th of a second, 1.2, at ISO 12,800. But... I'd rather have it than not, given what else I do. And if at some point you do want beautiful, fluid, dynamic shots with a gimbal, you're talking somewhere between 500 and 1,000 for a Crane or a Ronin S, say, bringing the body-only price properly kitted out just for that kind of shot to call it an even three grand, maybe 3,500. But then you also have to carry that sucker around with you. And this is not the kind of thing Claudia and I are willing to do for Photokina, for example, where the IBIS in the Panasonics is so good that we can easily live with a difference compared to a dedicated gimbal. Our dedicated gimbal has been sitting on the shelf ever since we got the GH5. Or, if we can't, this is interesting. There's always an iPhone with a $140 DJI Osmo Mobile. I'll put a link down to a video we did a while back using just that setup, though. To be fair, Claudia is one heck of a gimbal operator. So, 
Yes, let's call this paradox number six. The basic premise of hybrid mirrorless cameras being dramatically smaller and more feature-rich for motion, and therefore usable under circumstances where larger, more complex, or simply more noticeable cameras are not, is questionable with VR. 10. If you don't intend to shoot 10-bit 422, if you don't intend to shoot video beyond 30 minutes, if you don't intend to shoot beyond the capacity of whatever single card you put in the R, if you are sanguine about your workflow in the event of a card failure, then the R's uncompetitive specs on these things won't be much of an issue for you. For everyone else, these are significant issues, especially considering that they then have to add in the cost, weight, and unwieldiness of a whole setup. They, I'm just going to say you, you'll be adding an external recording monitor and likely a cage to go with it because attaching a 7-inch recording monitor, even a 5-inch one, with the additional weight of those batteries and expecting it to remain secure and tightly affixed to a hot shoe is a gambler's bet. And we're talking at least an additional grand, bringing the body-only price properly kitted out to 3300 just for that. We'll call this part and parcel of paradox number six, but note that now we're actually talking not 3300 but at least four grand, probably more, because a single-handed gimbal becomes too unwieldy or doesn't have the load capacity to get the recording time and motion shots you want. In 2018, this is simply not competitive with other much less expensive cameras, most notably the $1,700 Panasonic GH5 with its outstanding full readout 10-bit 422 internal video without recording limit, dual SD card slots, class-leading IBIS, excellent ergonomics, flippy screen, 3.7 million dot EVF, and even with its crop sensor, offers superior video quality and surprisingly close stills quality at normal print sizes and viewing distances. And then, Again, we still have uh, up on our wall a 27 inch by 40 print that we made from an image captured on a Fuji X-T2 JPEG straight out of camera. It was shot with the Acros film simulation that reminds me of nothing so much as medium format even when I'm nose to nose with it. Noiseless, rich tonality, mind blowing actually. The Fuji X-H1 uses the same sensor and as I said, does have IBIS but it doesn't have the same level of video capability of the GH5 or the R, nor the X-T3, at least as measured by codecs, bit depth, and bit rates. But for people like me, especially when the distribution medium is YouTube, those advantages evaporate. Though, by the way, moving from 1080p to 4K is more important than having the best glass, as long as the glass you have is good. I'll say this again too. Moving from 1080p to 4K, even if that 4K is then downsampled to 1080, is more important than using the very best glass or having the very best sensor. 11. If you don't intend to use high frame rates, 60 frames per second in 4K, 120 frames per second in Full HD, it won't matter to you that the R doesn't do them. But you may quickly find that you really do want them every now and again once you get into video. For most other people, this is another example of Canon's brand new camera simply not being competitive. The Fujis and the Panasonic G9 will do 120 frames per second in full HD. The GH5 will do 180, and both the G9 and GH5 will do 60p in 4K. Finally, 12. Every camera ever launched. There are teething issues, and that's fine, but from the absence of haptic feedback on the multifunction bar and repeated non-responsiveness of it, to the absence of a traditional mode dial for those who were used to it, though I am delighted to see it go, not a single dedicated physical label control for any of the primary exposure parameters, the exposure triangle, and of course, the lack of IBIS. Well, these are hardware issues that cannot be fixed quickly. Taken in toto, what I think I just shared with you is my sense that the primary reasons for existing Canon shooters to remain in the fold by adding the R to the mix, best-in-class autofocus, outstanding lenses, familiar manual of arms, excellent ergonomics, maximizing the return on one's existing investment in Canon bodies and gear, will likely not be valid for many of you if you think about it long and hard enough.
Though, if you love the R because you recognize and want the advantages of an excellent EVF for photography, previewing the exposure in real time through the viewfinder without having to chimp, without having to squint or otherwise deal with the reflections on the rear panel in a bright daylight, hey, I understand and I am truly excited for you. For those of you thinking of moving into Canon, however, my feeling is that this is not the camera with which, nor the time, to do it. It's inconceivable to me that the next iteration of this camera won't have IBIS in it, and that the crop won't have been eliminated. So, let me sum it up this way. If the EOS R were dramatically less expensive, or more importantly really, if the EOS R had been launched two years ago, at this price, instead of the 5D Mark IV for 3400 I think it could have been a revolution. Again, I encourage you to check out my previous analysis of the R I posted exactly one week ago. Instead, Canon has done what it's done, and we have what we have. Now, I'm not trying to be flippant or glib here. It is not my intent to call out anyone, nor my intent to criticize the many wonderful people with families who work at Canon. I understand that unit volumes in the camera industry have cratered. I understand that it has been an appalling, desperate change in the market requiring desperate measures that threaten the very existence of more than one storied brand. Kodak was the first titan casualty of digital, and more will follow. I understand the need for a company to be profitable. I understand the responsibility of a company to its employees to provide good jobs, stable jobs, rewarding jobs. I understand that profits fund R&D and acquisitions outside of the imaging space to round out the portfolio. I understand that some of my conclusions would likely be modified by extended time with the camera, and I'm willing to take another look after we're back from Europe. Canon folks, you know who you are. I'm looking forward to speaking with you directly while we're in Europe. Yeah, I understand too that there is a difference between YouTuber laments and actual market dynamics. Finally, I understand I'm just one person with an opinion. But for what it's worth, that opinion is informed by shooting exclusively with Canon for more than 40 years, and then shooting with pretty much everything else at one point or another since then. With that, I'm going to stop, because we have so many other commitments we've made, and only have another week before we head out, and I think you get what I've just shared with you. As I said before, reasonable people can disagree. And in the spirit of one of those titles I toyed with, irrespective of whether or not you agree with me, let's not get upset with each other. There are other things in this world far more worthy of our intellectual and emotional energy. Yeah. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmepthreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical, educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. 
we'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.